sort of <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming. Um, it's nice to have some people here. Apologies again that it's such a small turnout. Um, so Frank Cog over here, I must admit, is my second cousin, my mother's cousin. <laughs> um, your herbs, wife, Jackie, your mother. It's called so nepotism. <laughs> your cousin, okay. Yeah. So, and I must admit, I didn't know you knew anything about mining 4.0 until we were at my grandfather's 93rd birthday party the other day and we were speaking about it. So thank you for coming just now. So Frank has his MBA from Vix Business School and has recently done a postgraduate certificate in leadership coaching. Um, the background is in independent management. Okay, I'm reading this all because we never read bios because we know everybody, but we don't know Frank, so I'm getting it all. Um, his background is an independent management consultant with an extensive corporate experience in finance, marketing, and sales, logistics, and technical functions from su supervisory up to executive position in IT and telecommunications industry. He spent the first 15 years of his career, his career in technical services management and then became involved in managing the financial and business operations in these companies for a further 15 years at senior management and executive levels. From 2003 until 2010, he worked in the training and human capital development field for clients of government, parastatals, and NGO environments. And NGO environments. Frank has worked on projects for clients such as the Department of Labor, several SETAs, CETAs, not to CETA, CETA stand for again. Sector Education Training Authority. Okay. A bargaining council and two major banks. He's also written and facilitated training programs in areas such as project management, financial management, and financial intelligence. 2009, he became a coaching MBA. He began coaching MBA students at Vix Business School and became involved with activities at the Leadership Development Center and Executive Education Department as well. He has been a se sessional, 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 <laughs> sessional. staff member since yeah. 2013, working as a program director on development programs. Thank you very much for presenting. It's going to be about a. 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes yeah. talk and then to facilitate the, some discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dick. Um, yeah, so my title is Sessional Lecturer, but that sessional means you're part-time, you're not, you're not on contract, so okay. that's what it is. Um, so I work at the Leadership Development Centre as a program director, which means we run programs, we customise programs for corporate customers. Um, around leadership development. And quite a lot of our customers are my, mining houses, Glencore, Longman, African Rand, I remember. I've worked with them over the last uh, four to ten years. So I've got to know their management and some of their problems and some of their issues because it's just the same thing over and over again. <coughs> I'll just take you through. <coughs> so you asked about, who have you asked about who the students are? That's the kind of demographic of our, our students, although I admit the VIT students don't dress as well. Mm. Um, <laughs> but you know, that's the age group 25 to 45, junior management is 25, 35, senior management 35 upwards. So we have executive development programs for people up to the age of 50, 55 even. And this is the title of this talk really is, so it's a business perspective of Industrial, fourth industrial revolution and mining 4.0 from a business perspective from the business school, and I'll tell you why. Our mining customers asked us to focus this year on the two programs we ran for them, specifically on the fourth industrial revolution and mining 4.0. They said that's the theme for us and for the company and for the students. So, what is the fourth industrial revolution? Internet of Things and Internet of Systems. Yeah? And that last sentence, the last few words, challenging ideas about what it means to be human. And you're going to see a lot of focus on that in this. Yeah? Simple enough picture? Mm -hmm. So from the 18, early 1800s up to right now where we talk about cyber physical systems. Now I'm going to show you a short video of what that fourth industrial revolution looks like in a mining operation. So let's have a look. Some of you might have seen this. But I think it's interesting from the perspective of watch, watch it 
not from somebody who knows anything about mining, but from a student in a business school who's thinking about this kind of stuff. And it's, so look at it outside of your own kind of work experience and as a kind of a stranger almost to it. Machines roar across the dusty outback like a scene from Mad Max. But these vehicles have no one behind the wheel. No driver in there. It actually is really amazing, this technology. It's no fictional desert wasteland, but a thriving round the clock mine site, moving millions of tons of iron ore, pumping billions into the Australian economy. Welcome to the biggest autonomous mining operation on the planet. I firmly believe this is the way of the future. We're at Fortescue's Solomon Mine site, north of Tom Price, around 1,700 kilometres from Perth. It's 5am and the workers take compulsory breath tests before starting their 12-hour shift. There's a variety of roles and titles, but truck driver isn't one of them. Just this 302 thing up, it's pretty boggy. Yeah. So, we've just got to keep an eye on that one. This is the high tech control room for the driverless trucks. Because we don't have drivers on these trucks, that control room is really the heart and soul of our operation. Using computer screens with complex maps and signals, the mine controllers run the fleet of 56 autonomous trucks across three main pits. Their intervention into the system is by exception only, so when a truck stops, it's really up to them to troubleshoot why that truck has stopped, sort the issue out and allow the truck to proceed on its way. When the light changes from green to blue, the truck is in autonomous mode. A puff of smoke and a cloud of red dust, and this one is off for a day's work. Here's what it looks like inside the driverless truck. Each one is fitted with a GPS device their every move tracked by a computer server. The truck's got onboard sensors on the front of the machine that allows it to actually see what's in front of it. If obstacles approach, vehicles, people, birds, they'll slow down and come to a complete stop. Very predictable, very safe. There's a lot of programming in place to make sure that, um, that they will stop if there's an obstacle in the way. Each 160 ton truck carries 240 tons of iron ore. That's 400 tonnes of metal moving across the mine site at 60 kilometres an hour. When we have wet weather or when we have a bit of rain, we can apply global speed limits or traction control limits on the trucks, but generally the trucks will, will decide how fast they want to take roads and corners themselves. Only up close can you appreciate the size of these machines and the speed with which they travel across the mine site. And then you remember, there's no one behind the wheel. Since 2013, since we started the first autonomous trucks, we've moved over half a billion tonnes autonomously. It's not just trucks. These huge drilling machines used to be individually operated. As of late last year, they're now driverless too. We've got a fully autonomous, fully integrated mine site. We've got no separation as such between our manned operations and our autonomous fleet. Just wait till you see how the six autonomous drill rigs are remotely operated. This is where all the control takes place, this is our drill command centre. Two drill controllers monitor three rigs each using remote cameras and a wall of screens. When they need to manually control one of the drills, they do it using a video game controller. We've got an Xbox controller that we can actually control our drills with remotely. Yes, a standard Xbox controller, manoeuvring millions of dollars worth of equipment. So it looks like one big computer game. It does look like one big computer game, but I can definitely show you these guys are hard at work at the moment, um, drilling holes, and it's making sure that you know we achieve what we need to with this system. Before you get too worried about computers and robots taking over the workforce, Fortescue insists it hasn't slashed staff. There's absolutely been no redundancies through that whole process. We've planned this well in advance. We've made sure that all our people have been either upskilled, relocated to other operations, and opportunities for new jobs. 
Workers say the benefits include improvements to safety and productivity. We're about 30% more productive than a manned fleet. Um, so we're, you know, we're, we're moving the same amount of material with less trucks than we typically would with a manned operation. With the Solomon success, the autonomous fleet will soon expand to the Christmas Creek and Cloud Break mines. We're going to convert 100 trucks over the next two years at those two mine sites to have fully autonomous operation across all our three mines. After running two of the company's mines, Julie Shuttleworth has just begun her new role as Deputy CEO. FMG's top two jobs going to women. Two of their four core leadership team are, are women. There's a lot of support around that. But the most important thing is that people have been selected, what they bring to that role, what they deliver to the business and the results they deliver to the business. Back down on the mine, once the ore's out of the ground, the driverless trucks take it to the crushers. When the rocks come out of the ground, they're a little bit big for our customers. Um, we make them the right size and the right quality. Looking like giant roller coasters, a series of conveyor belts carries the precious cargo to a processing plant. We wash it, put it through some crushes, uh, a couple of separation processes, and then it's ready to go into the train. The final processing stage is here. This machine is called a reclaimer, which loads up to 17,000 tonnes an hour. Then it's off to the train, two kilometres long, 234 carriages, each one loaded in around one minute. There are no dump trucks, again it's all automated. The iron ore can now make its five hour journey to Port Hedland to be shipped to China. It does come down to this, ultimately this is what our customer is after. A tiny rock that's been sitting in an ancient riverbed for thousands of years. This is what we take crush it down into a fine gravel and that's the product that we provide to our customers. It's all done using cutting edge technology at what is the world's biggest autonomous operation, where half a billion tonnes of iron ore have been processed in less than five years. The mining boom is not over, we need mining, mining will continue no matter what the cycles do. While the price has been flat in recent times, the outlook for demand remains high. The big players are all looking for ways to produce more for less. We need to keep driving innovation, improve safety, improve productivity and efficiencies, continue to drive our costs down and make the companies more competitive. Escape on the keyboard and I'll start and then you can get it. Just double click. Double click. And then you have this problem with it. It's over there. Okay. So what did you think of that? It's a brave new world. That's quite old. It's about four or five years old. Sure. Oh. What are your thoughts when you saw that? Science fiction? What are we looking at in, in South African context? We're looking mostly 40% of the GDP is comes from the deep level gold mining. That's very deep level, three kilometers and beyond. Um, <coughs> another 30% comes from deep level platinum mining. That's another 2.5 kilometers and beyond. How would you do this in a deep level coal mining and platinum context? Yeah. So and on the ground, yeah. So platinum, <coughs> uh, platinum, which is Ivan Ho, they are actually trying to do the same thing uh, in South Africa with the block caving mine, which will be completely autonomous. Mm -hmm. uh, so Robert Friedman is actually trying the same thing in South Africa with the platinum, where there would be no person below it. it. I don't know how the gold mines would be done, but that's what he's actually trying so to do. The uh, Resolute Mine in Mali, yeah. Siama, is the first underground mine to be fully automated. But it is designed from scratch as an automated mine. Yes. That's we one would, we would face yeah, a very exactly. different problem here. Yeah. But uh, Oleg, you don't have to go far. Finch is actually blockaded autonomously. So Finch is a speck in, the, in Speck in the background. I mean, if you look at the average gold mine in South Africa, it employs 6,000 people, it produces, contributes 5% to the foreign exchange earnings. 
you know, when we look at the gold mining and platinum mining, that's most where most of our money, our money comes from. Diamonds is very small, small part of that game. How do we actually ought to do this? To in take into account that our reef is seventy centimeters thick. Yeah, you know, the gold gold would be difficult if the mining mining. I understand with you. Alex. It's a it's Gordon quite a labor intensive model. Exactly. Whereas this was not a labor intensive model. You're going to get to a level, aren't you? Yeah. Where you just it's not yeah. safe to go anymore. Well, that, yes. So we right? could exploit the deeper deeper resources. Yeah. If we could take out less, which would allow those to be accessible. And I mean, I mean, we're interested in this, right? Because we're interested in going down to five kilometers without putting any anyone in danger, right? Because in the end of the day. How can you mine safely at 4.3 kilometers? How can you mine safely, realistically, without how, putting how anyone can, in harm's way? Right? How can you, so, as a manager, ask some? Oh, that's it's a people question. How can you ask somebody yeah. to go down to that mm -hmm. level yeah. as a manager? Yeah. yeah. So no, no. Well, people are going down to, to that level already. People are going down to 3.8, 3.9 kilometers. <laughs> so that's pretty much it's, it's pretty that. much in that ball, ballpark, right? But. How, how do you actually do it more safely? Because we do need to improve our safety record but as a mining industry. Does this not come back to economics? Yes. Because somewhere along the line, you affecting the whole social structure of everything. I don't know how Australia works socially. I do know they very. They also very labour. They very labour. Uh, they also have a lot of trade unions. It happens to be an open cast mine. My background is civil engineering, and I, I love National Geographic on, on DSTV, and they say in America in the Appalachians, which is coal, which is not that deep, they run a coal mine with six experienced miners, but they are very gaming orientated. So they need cameras. They need equipment, and they have the same output as if it was fully labored. Okay? So now the question is, and I have someone in the family that went to Australia recently. This is a housewife in that condition. The f I, sorry, if you tell me to shut up, I'll shut up too. But she went to the petrol station, and she arrives there, and she says, there's no one going to help me here. So she, she sat in the car and looked at the next guy. She said, I'm going to go there and do this with my credit card. And she put in petrol. The next day, she went to the supermarket. There's no one at the, at the till helping her. You put on your bear, your whatever you bought. Summer they weigh summer. it. Okay, so the question is, how are we going to pay people that are unemployed? I don't know. You'll see it when we. Uh, you'll see the response, I, by the way of the students okay. now. I'll tell you what the what? students said. What do you want to? Well, say? I just wanted. So we did a course mid year, that MIT course at Timolakong. I don't know at the development hub up there. We went to visit Digimine, which is in the mining engineering mm. building, and all the students, because none of them were in mining, were very like, "You're going to put people out of work and blah blah." blah. And the lecturer there was very much existing mines will be mechanized to make them safer and more efficient, but people won't lose jobs. It will be the newly built mines that will be autonomous and not need as much people. But we cannot, maybe probably because of labor unions and the social structure will be damaged, we cannot put people out of work without upskilling or losing so, our way. So just on the point, I would just want to actually, to the point which you mentioned, autonomous mining. So I was in part of Indaba this year, and uh, I attended Indaba, and I, I come from Rio Tinto, and Rio Tinto has got these autonomous trucks and everything in the Australia region and stuff. And there were a lot of questions which were being asked by our uh, uh, executive director who actually presented it, pretty much regarding the social aspect. And uh, I'm actually quoting him. He actually presented a case study when the banking system actually changed. You remember the banking system where you used to go and stand in the queue and have the check and then have mm -hmm. to go through. And then you actually got these automated tailor machines, the ATMs where you actually go and there is nobody who is actually giving it out. That was the same situation which is happening right now in the mining scenario as well. The research actually shows that even when you actually put automated tailor machines and everything was through credit cards and online and transactions, actually the job of the accountant profile or, or the number of accountants required to do the job actually increased and didn't decrease. Yeah. 
and the reason it, what happened is they had to actually upskill or change their skill to go on to more on the automation side and how to actually work there. And same thing will happen in the mining industry where more people would be required for data scientists, gaming and automation and about machine learning. So it is actually about a shift which is happening. So you will not have physical labor with their pick and shovel hitting up on the rocks, but you will have these robots who will actually do massive amount of things. And that's where the whole basics actually comes down to the education system of a country where you have to focus on STEM, science, technology uh, and mathematics to actually come with. So, so those countries who are actually focusing on that, on the basic stuff, they will be a lot more competitive and be on the, on the up curve margin to actually pro provide that labor force. So that's, that's kind of the theoretical approach from business yeah. to how this is going to work. You see the bullet point there. So I showed the mining video as an example and the reaction from most of the students on both groups was not sure, regardless <laughs> of the need to compete. So they worked in teams, in syndicates, we call them syndicates with a company sponsor or executive system getting information internally and they had to write a research report, small report, 20, 25 pages on a business problem they could use to solve using technologies. Okay. And you, with that, that video as a context of maybe think a little bit like this. The topics they came up mainly related to automating manual activities, improving efficiencies and safety. Yeah? Focused on specific operations, in other words, the mine that they came from. No blue sky thinking, very averse to any job losses. So what they do didn't think What do you snow? mean by blue sky? Oh. Like paradigm shift, you know, like wow, it was all. I'll show you some of the, the topics. There was nothing there that, that made me or made the executives who watched their presentation think. Yeah, so a trap that a lot of leaders in the industry are falling into is looking at automating or improving efficiencies on existing processes. They're not looking at processes that are not currently conducted. Yes. And yes. that's really yeah. a blue So it's sky. incremental. It's all about incremental improvement. And the question is, as you would know this, is what's going to happen if somebody comes and disrupts your business model? Mm. We'll talk about that right at the end. Mm. Mm. And there are people, believe me, in this world, you know one from South Africa or yeah. Namibia, it's quite capable of doing that. Exactly, right? does that. Can, can I throw in a curveball here? I come from the civil engineering okay. background. Can you imagine a robot building a house? No human input. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it will go, and it will build from A to Z. It will be built. I can imagine that. Yeah, I can imagine that. Coming. Coming. With 10 engineers watching it. <laughs> <laughs> watching the robot. <laughs> so, um, Interesting again, to say I understand, some of the students come into the classroom wearing their red num shirts. That's, that's what they are. They, you know, no, it's not going to happen. We will make sure it doesn't happen. They're quite open about it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just the unions, it's the community. If you, if you guys are familiar with the local mining operations, the, the local community plays a very, very big role. If you don't have them on your side, they'll torch but we see what happens at London I mean I've heard some horror stories about London you don't get the community on your side if they, they think you are gonna retrench or get rid of their people they will turn on you yeah I Even think if you have a project like we had a project in New Bolt at West um, and we had all these drillers coming in and we just saw one truck coming in and within five minutes they were there trying to stop the truck from coming in so if you don't get them on that on your side Oh. Evening. So, Hi, so, so what's that? Education. <laughs> it's a whole. It's Some a shift. Just want, they just want people to be on the project, um, even if they just go pick up the papers or pick up whatever. But as long okay. as they, you know, yeah. being yeah. part of. Uh, Involved in it and can earn some. You can have live. To, you have to know that community so well. So a lot of them, the, the the problems at the mines, for example, London, where there was a lot of hassles a couple of years ago. So it was around an issue of a transport tender for the miners to come to the work. That's what it really was. And the guy who wanted the tender was stirring up all the trouble to mm. get the tender. Mm. So that basically, that's why they were always coming out on strike, because he, he was fermenting this so he would get the tender for the transport for the mine. That's basically what it was. 
got in mind? It says, you know, sometimes it's the people side of this is just totally overlooked. So I, I have quite an extensive background in mining operations from Southern Africa and Central and West Africa. And multiple, multiple things that you actually need to consider. Number one, you need to understand that mining has a very negative um, connotation in terms of environmental impact, like globally. Regardless where you go, communities don't want the mining operations near them, whether you go to Europe or North America, or there's always going to be issues because there's a negative um, connotation that's associated with the mining industry, regardless whether it's gold or diamonds or base metals. Number two, fight for resources. Mining's, mining operations are generally energy intensive, water intensive. You need to take that into account. Yep. If we live in an energy constrained world. There's going to be a fight for the resources in terms of your energy infrastructure between the communities and the mining operation. Southern Africa, you understand that we went from being a, um, being a water stressed to water scarce region, um, with most of the communities having access to way below a thousand kiloliters a month in terms of their water requirements. You, you're looking at a big problem. You're looking at the mining operations that using millions of liters of water every every day to a community that has zero. It's mm. a social, it's really a social cloud bomb that you're sitting on. And the damage it's doing, you know, the, what's happening down in the wall. Yep. You know, and I know the mining, the mining houses are talking to energy and water affairs about, because you know, they're so water intensive. Yeah. And they're sucking the wall dry. You know, to operate some of these mines, and, uh, and they're pumping the pollution that's coming back there's, out of it. There's really a number of issues, and it's impossible to separate those issues from the whole aspect of of the mining operation. That's even before you come to the job losses. Yep. That's even before you actually tackle the whole job losses equation. And those people that you're going to be losing in terms of the job losses, in terms of the IDOs, those are not the same people that will be driving your autonomous machines. See, That's the point. You're not going to scale up the yeah, people that lose their jobs. See, the, the point, ones are going the point to be is, really I, am, I am trying to put the devil's advocate here, but the point I'm saying is, your job losses will only happen when you, when you actually come up and say, okay, next day tomorrow I will have the autonomous trucks. What if you actually start your mine with autonomous trucks? What if you actually put it there? So the thing is, why where the job losses comes in, and where the perception of the community changes is when you actually promise something and you don't deliver, and then you try to do it. So, See, we are doing it right now in Richard's Bay Minerals, which is in South Africa. We, we are actually going on autonomous drill rigs. But what we are doing is the operators who are actually doing, they are actually being trained into to automate those drill rigs because they are the best person who knows in and out of that drill rig. They know if it breaks, how it actually works. They talk to them like they're baby, right? So, so they are the best guys. They, are, they might not be the best computer analysts or playing with the video games and stuff like that, but we are trying to actually do that. So that's first point. Second point, I agree with you, mining industry globally has got a very bad name. I will quote my CEO. My CEO, his 17 year old daughter, was asked, he asked me, what do you think what I do? And she said, I think you smuggle diamonds from one country to the other country. <laughs> that's my CEO, Jocks. What's his name, Arvin? Jocks, J.S. Jocks, uh, I'm for, it's a oh, French Quebec yes. name, but he actually mentioned, so it's, it's a recognized <laughs> thing. The mining industry as a whole has got a bad reputation across the economics. Yeah, you'll see that later on. But, but it's, to but it's not all the mining companies. There are some mining companies and environmentally it has been actually done. But as a, as a, as a group, we have to actually change the name and, and, and make it better because mining does bring a lot of other good things as well. Sorry, okay, let's get to the no, talk. That's fine. Yeah. The fine. talk is 20 minutes, the rest was the discussion. <laughs> we can, this is, you know, it's a good it's it's We have the discussion now or later. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not can, so, yeah. Sorry, can I yes. just interrupt because the one man who met her was the beers. So, I heard the story about the koi sand or the sand in yeah. the Japan, CKGR. Botswana, CKGR, are yeah, being relocated, re kicked into squatter camps and are all turning to alcoholism Ooh. because of mining companies in De Beers. So I might have asked some people at the Diamond course I went to, and they're like, 
yeah, but they keep on showing up when you find the water. I'm like, well, whose water is that? <laughs> so yeah. they were quite cagey about it. Yeah. <laughs> so well, yeah. yeah. I'll elaborate on that just now. I'm just going to see Mary. Okay, cool. Because I have to get going. Goodbye. Travel safely. So here's some of the, the, the topics from the, the research. And if you have a look at it, you know, improve leave application process. I mean, that's not exactly mind-blowing. Innovation and automation learning for hard rock mines and smelters. So looking at best practice for smelters. Well, that's a dangerous kind of operation. You can automate that. That's great. I don't think anybody would argue about that. Um, mine seismic and fall of ground detector. Using technology to detect fall of ground technology. Because what they do is they take apparently an iron bar, right, in their mine, mm -hmm. and they bang it against the rock and listen. Uh, you've got these detectors that use wireless um, antenna, and they've, they're a lot more accurate and a lot more safe, And but they're not being used. So the question was, of why? Did they research, they went and did a bit of research into, I mean, stuff like that. I, I looked at the CEO from this organization, I said, you've got the te technology and the engineers in this country that can build these machines. Why the hell would you want to import them? Mm. Yeah, he says, no, well, they are looking at it. He says, the problem is, and this is one of the problems, the guys working on this mine didn't know the big picture and the research that was being done to address this. So often that's one of the problems, is you work in a mine, but you don't see the big picture. Mm -hmm. You don't understand the whole thing. So that's a management issue. Comprehensive trackless mobile machinery, a TMM safety control system. So similar to what we saw in that video, you have detectors and everything, but you, what you do is you have a control room that's overseeing the person driving the truck. So and this is kind of a two-step approach you can almost imagine. So watch out, there's somebody behind you, you're getting too close to the edge. You know, you're, there's a problem with your tires, tire pressure, and you know, all those kinds of issues. Um, the last two, also quite interesting, digital vehicle reporting system to remove paper-based vehicle log. I hadn't realized that mines were so paper-intensive. But one of the things is before you can get in that truck and drive it, the TMM or whatever it is, you've got to fill in a report. You've got to walk all the way around, check, and you've got to give it to your supervisor who's got to sign it. And so apparently supervisors get something like 2,400 log sheets a week that they've got to sign off on. So very, very paper. And you can imagine the mistakes that are made. Mm. So if you automate this and you can't drive the vehicle because you haven't jumped through all the hoops and it gets recorded, and you've got a log. So if there's an incident, and they come out, because you know what happens when the department comes out and they want to shut the mine down. You can actually show them there's not just a paper trail and we've lost all the papers. Here it is digitally recorded. So that was, I think, a welcome thing. It's uh, welcome in the, in the operation. But not exactly mining four <coughs> <to> zero. <coughs> so this is an example of one of the mining groups. This is from their head office, their digital mine architecture. The green boxes with a tick of what's been done. The yellow box of the arrow is what they're working on. So you can see at a strategic level, a lot of thought has gone into what needs to be done. Energy management, real-time systems, ERP, um, which is another big challenge in this country, isn't it, with the railway? So it's not, ex it's not like they're not thinking about this. Don't worry, you can have a copy of the presentation. <laughs> this, getting back to your point, this is from one of the groups. They looked at it from a point of view of um, people, human capital. And this is a slide out of their report. Workforce age distribution. Have a look at the 36, 50, and 50 plus. That's 60 percent. 60, 70 percent nearly. 36 to 50. And look at this kind of millennial type. Those ages. And your point about, you know, 17-year-old um, girl at Waverly Girls High is not thinking about going to work in a mine. Who's, who's thinking about going to work in a mine? Maybe 20 years ago would have been something to think about. You guys work in this. I, I don't know what it's like at WITS, you know, in terms of mining and students coming through into to do like a BSc in mining. They don't even want to become geologists? <laughs> yeah? Or geophysicists? I think a lot of the geology students land there because they have no, all the other courses they want to do is school. Yeah. Um, and it's biology, geography, and geology, I think a lot of them land there by accident. And so they're struggling with that in terms of field trips. Like, 
I think if you were passionate about geology, you love to go out in the field. And now they're getting students who don't want to look at rocks. And so it's an absolute drag yeah. trying to literally drag sure. them through the field uh, for a week. So you've got this demographic <laughs> bulge <laughs> of the they boomers. They probably change courses. They, they, like have, they need to be at university and there's nothing else for them you to and do. I. Who are you pointing to? I'm worried that you're point, okay. pointing to are you me. older than me or younger than me? <laughs> I'm older than you. Oh, yeah. But can I, can I tell you something that this is a story again because life is stories. <laughs> I'm at school. I think I was in Standard 9, most probably in about 1960. And the mines were looking for mine, I don't know what they called them, mine, 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 let's call them, no, 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 mine managers, but down on the drilling and being involved in controlling a group, okay, they come along, they bring a bus to school, it was about, most probably about, I don't know, 120 of us, we get in the bus, take two hours to go down to the mine, what is the first thing they stop at? Not the bloody mine. They take us to the club. Look how long this pub is. It's 300 miles long and you can order any fucking drink that you want. Okay? It's been recorded. <laughs> uh, hang on, they understand French as well. Right? So they show you all these nice things. We've got a cricket pitch. We've got a soccer pitch. We've got a swimming Stop pool. Room. We've got a whole... This is my daughter that's just well, <laughs> Okay? And then you'll go for a nice lunch. Mm -hmm. And they take you down the mine for half an hour. Anyway, I go down this mine... I don't know how deep I was down, but let's say 3,000 meters. I don't know if it in those days. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, hey, there's a lot of rock above me. And I think, <laughs> and I think, hey, Harry can dig out his own gold or whatever it is. I like a blue sky. And I think to myself, but in my class, I think five guys went and did that. I don't think they do that anymore. I don't think they could do that anymore. I don't think they'd get any response. So that's the question. What are, what are the companies going to do to address this? You talk about mining having such a bad, bad rep, yeah? But what about, sorry, the 18 to 23 year olds coming from rural areas that there are no other jobs? Is that not traditionally the yeah. people who would work? So one of the problems, yeah, one of the problems in the rural areas is the chiefs won't give permission for the girls to get educated because it's against their culture. The women are there to stay in the village to care for the men and make sure. So the men go and work and bring the money back to the village. And this is, you understand the culture? This is my Tradition. town life. This is, this Which is what it is. Are, is and you've got to, hmm? Which countries do you get that, that kind of situation? Which country do you get a situation like that? Where yeah. Which country is do you get? That kind of situation. Yeah, in London, you know, I've heard stories again about them struggling. Because, you know, the, one of the big problems with mines is meeting their BE targets. And they really, really struggle to get women in on board. And one of the problems is that the local resistance by the community to allow girls to join their, their workforce training program. So it's, it's a big problem culturally as well. So, oh. Steph, that's, you know. So edit the program we presented all of the stuff to the management and this is sort of feedback oh, this is the old presentation yeah um, still the same same points but management said gains are incremental in most cases in terms of what they, they saw no paradigm shift local focus of research only working on single operation they didn't consider the big picture the students response was in view of no labor reduction, large-scale changes could not be recommended. So no one group was prepared to say we're going to make changes to the labor force. The teams came from all different operations. So often you had gold and coal and, you know, a mix of... And then again, you, on these programs, you have not just mining people, you've got... They're mining people, but they're back office. So it's HR or finance or... You know, people who work on a mine, but they're not involved in the operation, so they don't understand physically what it's like to be on site. Um, this gets to a point you guys made earlier on. Many operations have a basic infrastructure that doesn't support the new technology. So, you know, for example, mm -hmm. Wi-Fi is not available underground. What are you going to do underground? Skill levels don't match the new technology. So, in a sense, yeah, you can skill some people up, but some people are just not going to be, and that's just... Not just the young people, some of the old people say, in a way, it's a good thing a lot of the old people are moving on and the young people can come in because 
we all know what kids can do nowadays. My boy's got an Xbox and a tablet, and they do things that are, you know, it just blows me away how he discovers this stuff. This is now, I'm going to talk about the stakeholders very, very quickly. Pasatu. Our unemployment statistics are shocking and we are not going to allow the reckless introduction of mechanization and automation. That's Kasatu's view. The National Council of Trade Unions, slightly more measured approach. Interesting in the last sentence. It requires us to think how we are going to look into the labor laws of our country. I think. Um, they accept that it's become compelling for workers to adapt to the fourth industrial revolution. So they accept that in principle, but the issue is going to be the labor laws. View from government, the minister, when she opened this um, precinct, this is a speech she made to Mining Weekly Online. Again, the last point, but in instances where in its depths become untenable for humans to reach, robotics will be used. So there, they, you know, they accept the fact that if we want to go deeper and deeper, we can't put human lives in danger, we're going to move to robotics. We'll, we'll allow you to move to robotics. Um, so that's quite positive. Uh, I could not find a single quote from Gwedi Mantashe on this subject. Mm. Nothing. This is from the former president of the Chamber of Mines. Again, very much in favour. We have to do it. But again, the last sentence. Whilst recognising its impact on jobs. So everybody kind of, except the union, everybody says... We have to do it. We've got to be mindful of jobs. Looks like the union's view is we're not going to do it. This but if, if we're competing in the iron ore recovery against Australia, and they that make that make digit, digitized, they've got those control rooms, there are no trucks in the drivers, surely the ton per price, we can't compete. No, they, what is the cost? They, the, the, the comment from most of the students was, we don't care. We don't okay, care. Can, 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 can I just comment on that? You know, it's, it's unbelievable, oh. but the geography dictates mm. the distribution of all deposits in the world. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at Australia, mm. Russia, or Africa. Right? If you have a 40% on all deposit in DRC, people will go there because it's a 40% on an all deposit in the DRC. If you have a if you have uh, you know, 30, 30 grams per ton ore deposit in South Africa, people will go there because it's 30. And the geography dictates the distribution of the ore deposits. So sometimes, we, most of the times, we actually don't have a choice where to be in terms of the geographic demands on yeah. mining, in terms of diamonds, gold. And know, the natural and resources around yeah. that. But how are you going to compete against the local residents that say, we want a job in that mine, and the guy says, but I, I don't have the skill to do that. that. It's going to be a hassle. No, no, it's going to be a balance between the profit margins yeah. and, you know, what you yeah. can realistically achieve. Yeah. Um, in the end of the day, you know, if you have a 50 gram per ton gold deposit in DRC and you have a 5 gram, five gram a ton deposit in Australia. So th the one thing is, Australia produces uh, price which is half what the market actually buys. If the market buys at $40, Australia produces at $20. In South Africa, one of the biggest mines which is here is just making the cutoff of what the consumer is actually asking, $40. So the price is actually being def decided by the market, not by how much you do it. Mm -hmm. So definitely the mines in South Africa are not making money. Although the product is as good as that of the Australia. You can ask a question. The other thing, just uh, I will tell you the other yeah. thing. There are a lot of potential in, in Africa, but iron ore and mining business is not only about, about the resource, it's about the infrastructure. And unfortunately, if your infrastructure is not there, no mining company can make money out of that, yeah. whatever the situation could be. And that's why, unfortunately, the DRC would not be a mining hub and other than cobalt for next 15 years. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Which mine do you think will exist 20 years down the line in Australia? Australia has got another 100 years to actually mine. No, which From mine exactly will exist still mining 20 years down the line in Australia? Which mines would ex yeah, exist? because most of them have 20 years No, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, mining at that pace. Yeah, at that pace. I don't know. It's going to increase. 
I don't know where we'll ex- I, I, I can tell you which mines will exist in South Africa 20 years down the line. I don't know. You don't know. In Australia, there is another 100 years of iron ore there. In Australia, the Pilbara, there is 100 years of iron ore. And perhaps, um, to, I don't know what you are saying, the reality is that in Zimbabwe, people left, they left mines, they still gold there. Now, in South Africa, we've mined our gold, and we are talking about uh, five kilometers now, and at some point, that's going to stop. But uh, and in, in, in Zim, uh, two thirds of their um, foreign earnings comes from mining, and the majority of that comes from gold. The gold they just pick. People is just, you just go there and pick. You just send it to government. It's so ground level. Yes, yeah, it's uh, some yeah, that. Yeah, some it's the the bearings. It's quite no, everywhere. Alluvial. No. Yeah, it's Sorry, everywhere. Mr. So President, please, you wanted to have a few words. It's quite yeah. It's a this never has a few words. <laughs> what they used to do on the bits in the seventies. Yeah, but the point is that the the point is that uh, resources are not mining is not renewable. That's the point I think uh, Oleg is trying to try to drive that. I'm slightly different point, but I'll elaborate elaborate, elaborate on that. Okay. Okay. Now I'm saying um, resources have a finite Mm. uh, uh, span, and um, I think each according to your own geographical constraints. Um, in, 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 in South Africa, for me, with, um, with skills, I mean, we have to take into consideration where we come from, why are people uh, in, in those conditions, and you cannot just um, um, uh, um, uh, um, retrench people. That is why, I mean, I understand where students come from, say, we don't want the thing. It's for them, it's, I think it's more emotional. Then, 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 then yeah, anything. but no, you understand where they are. Um. So I just wanted to elaborate on the point that I made, right? So in the end of the day, the money that you want to raise on international markets depends on how productive your operation is going to be and how long your operation is going to be around. There's only certain type of mines that can show that it can be around for the next 20 or 30 years. And that's say if it can be global gold mines, regardless of which way you look at it. You look at the platinum deposits in uh, Canada, you're looking at the platinum deposits in Russia, they're gone in the next 10 years. The only thing that can produce platinum for the next 20 to 30 years is push oil. But the platinum would not be required in the market in the next 20 to 30 years. How do you well, know? Because of the you, can't, you can't say that. How do you know? Because the diesel cars are being actually stopped. Yeah, we'll actually. find new uses for it. But like it. That's, that's, that's it's Elon Musk. It's Elon Musk. We'll get to it later on. But I can, can I just ask one more thing, just yeah. on Sandra's thing? Is because I mean the question is not like eventually mining will stop in South Africa because it's going to be too mm. expensive. The labour laws are going to be ridiculous. So I know the students are saying we don't want it, but are they being? Is it being emphasised that actually in some cases, unless we mechanise, mining will stop regardless? Yep. So all these people will lose jobs anyway. But what they are doing, you know, there's a case in Komileni, uh, in the Eastern Cape. They yeah. are saying, we don't want mining to begin with. So, for example, now communities, because they are empowered by law, they are stopping. They want their own economic activities, which has nothing to do yeah. with someone who's going to so come and dig the their community's got to give permission yeah. for mining to happen, <coughs> and, they're, and they're not prepared to give permission. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Simple. It gets back to your point about destroying the environment, and I think this is what they're, they're concerned about. It, it might create jobs. But it's going to decimate the local environment. But existing jobs might be lost anyway when mining mm. stops because yeah. it's too expensive and it's too deep. In my my view is you know from a policy point of view, I don't think I don't see any kind of this kind of thinking at at government level in terms of what is South Africa PTY or SA Limited as a company. What are its core critical strengths? as a company how do we market and mm-hmm. sell what we have because we need to bring money in to balance the payments and all the rest of the stuff how are we going to get dollars into this country what are we going to do to get dollars into this country so we don't have to knock on the door of the imf mm-hmm. sorry i just wanted to mention one point like north america and southeast asia is moving away from oil in terms of electrical energy driven cars right yeah. uh, we can survive as human species without oil pretty easily and plastics mm-hmm. so we can't survive without mining products bottom line that's that's undebatable mm-hmm. so mining in one form or the other is going to have to happen in the future in over the next 200 years 
like if we stop all recoveries right now, we will <coughs> suffer as a result of the energy crisis. But we'll get over it and we'll find replacement products in terms of lithium batteries and stuff like that. But this will all be part of the mining products. But that's what the whole, the whole, I think that's what brings your point to this talk, the, yep. the, the title of the talk 4.0. Yep. You will only be able to do it with 4.0 by doing that. You can't go on and on with your labor intensive workforce yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. to actually have a sustainable mining. Sure. But this is the point here now, this guy is saying, as Greg settled, that the fourth industrial revolution is already over anyway. He says there's been very little real development of technology We've got to a stage where, uh, look at that very last point. New technologies uh, add to the convenience, but little else. Look at your phones, look at your, yeah. Look at the computers. Basically, I mean, I, I've had computers and internet for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, 25 years. Um, and it's gone from dial-up, you know, 384K to 100 megabits fiber, which is wonderful. But I'm still doing basically the same bloody thing. Hey, mm -hmm. Word, Excel, PowerPoint, mm -hmm. internet, it's just, a little bit more faster and sicker. And I so said, after the past 20 years, from an IT point of view, it's just been faster and quicker, but there's been no real kind of woof. I mean, I've got one of those little Google homes at home, and it's great, and I'm slowly automating my house with all these devices. Alexa. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got, yeah, the, the Google Home one, my son uses most of the time because it, it helps him with his homework, you know. I was cheating with it. Um, <laughs> Alexa do the homework. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, what, yeah, the typical one. Yeah. How high is Mount Everest? You know, that sort of stuff. Or yeah. even the mass, divide this by that. But he's, he's basically saying, you know, it's we've, we've, we've gone as far as we can with what we've got. There needs to be something else. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And our mind view is going to be, how do we make people work with this? I think we start... We need to start focusing on people and not the technology. We've got to say, what are we going to do with what we've got, with the people we've got? And everybody's saying... We've had keyboards for way too long. Yeah. <laughs> Throw technology at, at, at the problem. It's, it's not really doing much for us, is it? Huh? I want to just go back now. For me, the outcomes, what I took out of this. this. So, and this is significant union and local community buying large-scale mm -hmm. automation mm -hmm. is not going to happen. A political solution is needed. This is a policy political issue. It's not, it's not a management issue. Some digitization and upskilling is going to happen anyway. It just <coughs> general drift the way things work. I think we need to focus on product competitiveness. A lot of the students seem to think that we didn't have to automate because our ore was better quality than Australia. So we could command a higher price. And our I think they quite understand. Labor is cheaper. Market forces, yeah. No. <coughs> South Africa labor is no labor more cheaper. Cheap, electricity yeah. cheaper. South Africa labor is no more cheap cheaper. It's, it's cheaper and it's uh, not risk averse. So South Africa labor is no more cheap. It's not risk averse. Yes, but the thing is it's so safe. a lot of the automation is driven by Im improvements to safety. And in South Africa, well, the culture really is where somewhat dispendable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's where I think a lot could be done in terms of what automation, the wins for automation from a mining point of view is reducing fatalities and mine shutdowns and all of that kind of thing. That, um, mm -hmm. But you've got to be careful how you sell it to yeah. the workforce. <coughs> so what we're also selling automation for is to environmentally, in a sustainable way, to extract the ore. So if you look at the thin gold and platinum reefs, Right. If we can just extract that mm -hmm. with minimal dilution, we don't remove that much waste from like from the from the ground back to the surface, right? So we save on electricity, we save on energy, well energy costs, we save on labor because we don't have people at the stoke. So there's a whole lot of different factors that are driving that need to automate and mine more environmentally friendly. Uh, Again, that's almost an incremental improvement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, a big focus on human capital development, both from a term, in terms of demographics in your workforce, but also the skills uplift. And I think, uh, I'll say the one company that I work with, African Rainbow, very, very big on that. They focus a lot on their people, they invest 
a lot on their people. They spend a lot of money. And that's it's great to see that, you know. Yeah. But I would say with the internet 4.0 or whatever, this next industrial revolution, it's going to affect everyone. It's not just mining. You're not mm. going to have to just skill guys to be miners. They're going to have to skill if they want to be accountants, plumbers, anything. So it's going to be a natural progress. Just how everyone now knows how to use a smartphone, they're going to know how to operate a screen and a thing, and they're going to fit Absolutely. in seamlessly into the mining. So, you know, you, you, you will walk into a mine environment, and if the mine environment doesn't have the technology, you're not interested in working there. Herb. I mean, this is kind of what the guy's going to say is when he goes and he lives in a mining environment, if he can't stream Netflix at night, he's not interested in that. Isn't that what it really is? You've got to make the place attractive for the people you want to come and work there. So, um, you know, one, one <laughs> Elon Musk's name came up a few times in, the, in, in his program. Is, and I said to them, so what happens if he can, he can do it? We know he can do it. Huh? Because, you know, I, read, I used to read science fiction, and I still read science fiction as a kid. And I used to read about mining on asteroids, and I used to, like tech science fiction. That video we saw, that's entirely possible, isn't it? If you had if you had an asteroid up there that was like almost pure platinum, do you think we couldn't automate a mining approach? If Elon Musk had to buy an abandoned mine here, he wouldn't get near it. Because there'd be illegal mine mining operations. <laughs> and they'll never close. <laughs> so yeah. disrupt that. <clears throat> the point being is you can run a mine, if you look at that operation, you can run a mine anywhere in the world. You don't have to be from physically. anywhere. Yeah, from world. anywhere in the world. You don't have to be there. Yeah, you can, you can go and say, "I'm buying your operation. I'm going to run it from New York." All my people will be in New York until the machine breaks a little bit. Yeah, or and the that's machine that fixes the machine breaks. That's the one thing where I saw opportunities because it's very maintenance, maintenance intensive. There's great opportunities yeah. for labour and all of that because somebody's got to fix all these damn things because they're going to break all the time. Yeah, I have someone very close to, to me, he's a young computer guy, he's just been to Australia. Now their computer program, they've developed a program where they will processify the whole operation of the mine. When it needs to be serviced, what the oil, it's no, not no, viscous, it's the mine, the, 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 the shafts, the mine ropes, the whole thing. He's got a program where you can put those, all those programmers, a program together, and it will tell you when and how and what part of the mine you need to service before it will pick up a stick. And there were three mines in Australia that are implementing that program right now. So it gets back to the old story. You remember when the motor car replaced the yep. horse and buggy? Yeah. Hey, and they said, shame, what are all the blacksmiths going to do? They've all been put out of work. Well, maybe they have been put out of work, but think how much employment the motor industry yep. has created. So my, my, my own view is, as a lot of people have said, we can't avoid this. This is not something that we can avoid. It's going to happen. We are going to be forced to compete. I think South Africa eventually is going to be forced to compete and it's going to become a really hard painful lesson well <coughs> unfortunately the culture is just to keep on the curve south africa generally is never ahead of the curve so we do just enough and we cling to our old habits we're very change averse yeah. and we don't see the opportunities we don't see the forest of the trees yeah. quite often but that's the nature of the world, is you that's pull the out those guys yeah. from the mines, and now you've got 4,000 guys that can work in the factory and actually make something like, instead of exporting the minerals yeah. in an yeah. ideal world. Yeah. So they can work in beneficiation part. Yeah. Now you need to make that value clear, so that they don't... And build the factories before you fire Hinder <laughs> progress. <laughs> 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 okay. um, Auto automation is also quite labor intensive. You have to have... Yep. Guys who have to write algorithms, you have to have guys who have to prepare laptops, you have to have guys with IT skills and all mm. those things will come up. So, so, so one, one thing with, that with automation. Young guys. Yeah, that's what we're talking One thing with automation that you, know, you mentioned yeah. here is that you, now, you transform or you hey, perish. You now the change. Survive. That's the rule <laughs> of the safari. You now change the 
the geographic distribution of where those services are being provided yeah. from. Yeah. So as soon as you automate something like this, you could source that programming that you mentioned from anywhere in the world. Yeah. Yeah. It does not have to be local anymore. Exactly. Which is something that I think yeah, the, the community is has difficulty is going to have adapting to. Yes. So, you know, in, in the local community needing to be internationally competitive. So this is something Nick Binadel used to tell students way back in 90, the early 90s when he was head of the, the business school. But somewhere in the world there's somebody who can do your job just as good as you or better, cheaper than you, and he's probably in India. And, you know, just never ever forget that fact. There's somebody in yep. this world who wants your job. And they can do it from where they are. With the technology we've got now, they can do it from wherever they are. And, you know, you've got to rub people's noses in this. The only, mm -hmm. only person who can't do your job, or the job you want, is like maybe, like you say, with a pickaxe and a mine. Or The only issue with this whole concept is that the impacts of the mining legacy is only felt for the local communities. Mm -hmm. Very good point. So, yeah. in the end of the day, the guys that actually suffer on the ground are the guys from the local community. And that's the biggest point. That's the reason why Sianda actually brought in the solo case from the, I think that was Nobel case. Yeah. 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 It's so, both. In fact, so, the second one. So, the, the, the issue is, yeah, you, you, you can run a mining operation, you can outsource pretty much 95% of the stuff, but mm -hmm. the guys that are left with this legacy are the yeah. guys that actually live there. Mm. It's not the guys that you, you can bring in billions and billions and billions of dollars into GDP from a mining operation, but in the end of the day, the guys that suffer are the guys that actually live the unless, yeah. unless, of course, they have a structure of making the, um, the communities around the mine like a trust fund from the mining oil. So, or them out. That yeah. actually, because currently, like all of the mining money like goes into a national Rather. pool. But if they have the regional pool, it might benefit. What's the but the point also, it's not only that they no longer have work, you've destroyed their local environment as well. Absolutely. Polluted the rivers, you know, yes, etc. So, I mean, I often drive through to um, to um, Pumalanga to the Glencore Coal Operations where I work at their local training centre. So, I actually drive through those areas where they're rehabilitating that area. And I mean, please. <laughs> hey? it's, not, it's not pleasant, is it? Hey, when you yeah, see what it's, it's, yeah, it looks, it's, not, it's not, it's just not pleasant. And you, do, you don't want to live there because you know the, the, the smog, you see it coming in on the highway driving through. Who would who, want to, I have to be honest, who'd want to live in that area? Just to use less coal. Just one, one question, right? Like your knowledge of the mining industry, etc. Can you, can you tell me what, what is the biggest mine that was recently closed and rehabilitated? Closed and rehabilitated? Well, the fact it, that you're thinking about yeah, it tells yeah. me that. No, no, it has, there are plenty, I can, I can actually tell you in North America. In South Africa. In South Africa. Uh, Prisca. Do you know the ones? Prisca. Prisca. Yeah. I can tell you now. Prisca is being restarted. It was rehabilitated. That was the only mine in South Africa which has got the uh, mine closure uh, certificate. No other mine which has been closed has got a mine closure certificate. That could be due to administrative Prisca. issues. Prisca. So why, Prisca. Are, why, aren't we going why aren't we going nuclear? Hmm? Sorry? Why aren't we going nuclear? No. Emphatically no. No, 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 but, but there but, is but, never but, but a, a question like, enough. like take into account the gold and platinum legacy of South Africa, right? What was the what was what were the mines that were closed and rehabilitated? Right. We know that we have, obviously we have, there are but the thing is that this lot can talk for you guys imagine hmm? how long are we going to Oh wait, that wasn't the mean no, Interesting. No, no, no. I mean, I'm not a mining guy. I'm a yeah. business guy. So I look at it purely from a yeah. business point of view. So you talk about 50-year lifespan. So how much capital do I need to employ? What's my return on investment? And what mm -hmm. are the risks for me? The business risks. People. I don't. I don't trouble with people. I don't trouble with government. I don't want mm -hmm. riots. I don't want people being killed. I don't want conflict. Politics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't. Want, I don't want to get involved in any of that. And you want to get out before it happens. Yeah. So, so, you so you want to sell it before you close? Yeah, I want to be like Elon Musk. I want to run my yeah. mine from New York. Yeah. I mean, really? What's the incentive? So think of it from a businessman's yeah. point of view. What incentive would you have to come to South Africa and open up a mining operation? Very little. The only incentive that I could think about is the profit margin. And that will yes, take the risk of your No, but mining is a marginal business, though, guys. 
Depends where. Depends, depends, depends where. Exactly. Yeah. It's the ge ge geography of it. It's, it's, it's not a short term decision you make. It's a 30 year, 50 year commitment yeah. to that area. What's Rio Tinto? So, since I'm holding the wine bottle, okay, we, well, he needs to go and we can carry a table. I get to make the last point. So, the MIT course that we did, first of all, okay, earlier, a month before I was meant to go down into a gold mine, and the day that I got there, they were like, the day before a guy died because he had an asthma attack walking down the stairs because the travelator was broken. And, like, they said it so flippantly and as if it was his fault. I was like, you know, it was your travelator that was broken. So, just lives are very cheap on the gold mine. And also on the course that we did, they point out three things. They had an electronic drill that would have less damage to the ears. They said none of the miners used it because they equated noise with productivity. And it was too quiet, like therefore it wasn't as productive. <laughs> Second of all, they said earplugs. They don't wear them because they can't hear the cracking of the face as it's about to explode. So they'd rather give up their hearing to dying. And the third thing was, a uh, so student had to come up with ideas on how to improve mine safety. And one of them was putting trackers on the miners so you could see where yeah. they were when they stuck and he said no yeah. trade union will let you track a miner because then you can see where they are where they're not supposed to be yes. also you cannot track their beat their heart rate or anything like that because then you know when they're sitting doing nothing instead of working mm -hmm. so and the third the fourth thing was wi-fi in the mines mm -hmm. is nowhere close it's just that there's so much interference with the signal it's yeah. a huge yeah. i think we've got a long way to go yeah. I, I,